we express the love of Jesus Christ and the passion that He had is that we go out there and we serve others. We go to the out-of-bound places, the ends of the earth. The world is changing, but the gospel doesn't change. The message of the cross doesn't change. We're going to make every effort to share the gospel. The world has been decimated by COVID-19, but the work here at Samaritan's Purse, it never stops. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. And we do it through Operation Christmas Child. It's a platform that God has given Samaritan's Purse to share the gospel more than 10 million times every year. Jesus loves you. The wonderment of it is that the child's encounter is not with material things. By faith, the encounter is with things unseen, and they're receiving that for the very first time. today with Veterans Recognition, honoring what I was raised to call Armistice Day, 11-11-11. Go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for our veterans, the men and women who are serving at home and abroad to protect us in this country. We thank you for their integrity, humility, service and leadership, and their sacrifice. We thank you for their generosity and service and their willingness. We ask that you draw them close to your loving, protecting hands of grace, they and their families. We ask that you bless them with health and keep them safe, bless their relationships, their families, their finances, and their future. We pray this blessing upon the lives of all of our veterans, those who serve us even today, in the air and on the land and upon the sea. Amen. I ask all veterans active and those who have retired from service to please stand that we can recognize you today and their families and give them recognition. I invite the whole congregation to stand and worship Jesus Christ this day.
I'm the director of children and family here, children and family outreach here at Avalay Presbyterian Church. I have a couple of announcements for y'all. The first being that we have a youth event today in the gym after Sunday school. We'll be eating lunch, filling up some shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child, and after that we'll play some basketball in the gym and just hang out and have fun. The second announcement I have for y'all is the children and youth Christmas pageant is coming up. It'll be December the December the 5th at 9.15 during the service. Um, the, there will be one practice and one dress rehearsal, the practice being on December 1st at 4 p.m. and the dress rehearsal will be December the 4th at 10 a.m. There will be food provided at both. If you have any questions about that, you can email me at avaladce at outlook.com or email pierre at avaladeworship at gmail.com. And now, children of all ages are invited to come up to the front for a children's message. glad to hear that. Will y'all hold that for me? One for you, one for you, one for you. 
One for you. <laughs> I want to share with y'all one of my favorite verses today, and then I'll let you know why you're holding a paintbrush. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know, when I was sitting before and just kind of thinking about God and who he is to me, he brought up this picture of a painter. Now, when you start painting a picture, do you know exactly what it's going to look like in the end? No. You think you have a little vision of it, but sometimes it does or doesn't turn out quite the way that we expect it to. Well, something I know about God is that everything he does is perfect and wonderful. And he's like the painter of our lives. He invites us to sit next to him while he paints beautiful things in our lives and for us. But sometimes, being the humans that we are, we don't realize what God is doing, and sometimes we try to take that paintbrush away and do things ourselves. And sometimes, most of the times, if we're all the time, if we're taking that paintbrush out of God's hand and trying to do things our own way, it doesn't end up the way that we think it is. But guess what? God is all too wonderful and kind and loving, and He, if we give Him back that paintbrush, He'll take it back. And in his way, in his time, he'll paint over that mistake and he'll continue on in that beautiful, beautiful picture in our lives that we don't see right away, but we know there's going to be a beautiful picture at the end. You know, when you're painting, there's going to be a beautiful picture at the end. So, will you all bow your head and pray with me? Dear God, thank you so, so much for who you are. Thank you so, so much that you love us and that you want what's best for us. Thank you that you have this beautiful, beautiful picture in each and every one of our lives that you are all too willing and wanting to show us. I pray that you will just give us the peace and love and perseverance as we walk through today and the week and the year and be with each and every one of these people here, God. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Miss Sarah. Lovely children's message. Children may be dismissed to Children's Church, and they'll be dismissed. Take a moment, look at your worship bulletin. Please locate your sermon outline. I like to put those in there every week. Maybe you're a part of the uh, Talk About It Sunday School that goes over the outline um, uh, every Sunday during the Sunday School hour. And also, at least you'll know when I'm about to quit if you're following the outline. And if you look at your worship bulletin, announcements, Operation Christmas Child, Forever Young, Wednesday Family Night, it's turkey dressing dinner. Um, I, I would really like to know how many people are coming, how many turkeys have to bite the dust. And uh, Avalay Advent candle lighting begins. And the other, the hanging of the greens, the youth pageant. You see the connection card for how you can make the connection and get involved in your church family's congregational life right there. Uh, we're looking at the, um, the hanging of the greens fellowship. There are dates that are currently uh, typed in. Those are potential dates. If you just tell me you're interested in being a part of hanging of the greens, and you tell me when you can spare 15 minutes or 22 and a half minutes or three hours. You just tell me and we'll get a task for you to come at your convenience to come and, and to participate in, in your own, well, hanging of the greens. We'll, we'll work even that way too. And those are all on the connection cards. Welcome to any guests and visitors. To those of you in the live stream viewing audience, welcome. It's a blessing to be with you today. And also to those in the Truesdale Hall worship alternate site. It's a blessing to be together with you, and it's a blessing to know that you're out there worshiping with us. I want to also talk to you about uh, service. Service. Uh, while we've been so uh, isolated during the COVID-19 things, it's a, it is a essential part of Christian living to be in service and love to one another. And uh, so I want to invite you to, um, uh, to take a Thanksgiving dish to someone on Thanksgiving morning. You know those little carry-out boxes that I have down in the kitchen? If you'll just say to me, yes, I'd like to do that. Who will we take it to? Avalay active members who are shut in that cannot cook, that usually just eat 
crackers and Campbell's soup and ravioli so that they can have a turkey and dressing meal. If you would like to be a part of Take a Plate, you have to come to me directly. That is so personal and confidential. We're not going to broadcast that out in a lot of written things. And those are our announcements for today. Be sure to log in to avalay.org. We can move one more slide forward, please. Um, you can... Go to the Lord with me in prayer. Let us be in prayer. Let us be people of prayer. Saints of God, let us pray. You, O God, are our good shepherd. You grant us this one life. We spend our days trying to save it, lengthen it, protect it, and hold on to it. The truth is, though, Lord, real abundant life doesn't come from our human striving. We can't eat enough, exercise enough, or medicate enough to gain abundant life. Help us to see that, Lord Jesus. Jesus, everything we are longing for, a long life without You is actually a lost life. Give us a longing, that a hunger for You and everything that You offer. Our lives are truly Yours. So we ask, do not withdraw Your offer of abundant life from our nation and its people. Help our leaders to discover the true power of wealth is trusting and obeying You. A blessing for our doctors and our nurses, teachers in schools, parents and family, for those who work in our nation's businesses, offices and factories. Help them to believe and receive always of Your abundance. And we plead, O oh God, for the protection of those who serve and defend us in our community first responders and in our military, for Christian brothers and sisters who gather all around the world to worship you, even in lands where being known as faith is peril. And teach us to pray as Jesus Christ taught every disciple to always be found praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Instructions for online giving are coming up on your uh, screen if you're an online audience. Uh, the annual church budget and stewardship season, well, it culminates next week. Your uh, choices for Christ will define your Avalay Church family's ministry and mission for the year of 2022. Our uh, fellowship chairman, uh, Elder Gene Crocker, has mailed you an uh, estimate of giving cards. And we ask you to hand those in. And uh, next Sunday, our Thanksgiving service, it will conclude with a moment of personal consecration. If you so choose, you can bring that card and your prayer for God to help you to be faithful in that commitment forward at the end of next Sunday's service. God willing, the ushers are coming in this moment, at this day, and this time. Consider your stewardship before the Lord Jesus Christ.
scripture text today from John chapter 10. It's found in the Purack Bible on page 1151. We're at week 10 of 10 of a sermon series from this fall called God's Glorious Promises. This is week 10, the greatest promise at all. Christ, He promises you abundant life. Hear and heed God's will, God's word for you this day. John 10, beginning with verse 1. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by the other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters the gate is a shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you, verse 7, the truth, I am the gate of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock. It's scattered. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Friends, this is the Word of the Lord. Oh, I got up this morning. You did too, didn't you? I got up. I've got an amazing alarm clock. She's about seven and a half pounds. And the last dog got up when the sun came up. No, this dog gets up at 4 a.m. The new dog. She gets up, and that was okay. I didn't mind getting up at 4 a.m. That's the regular scheduled time anyway, and I was already awake. And I was just, do you ever just lay there in bed and and you're just thinking about all the drama going on in your life? Yeah. 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 We're right there. You're with me today. Yeah, yeah. We're right there on this. I'm just sitting there thinking, I've got eight shingles off my house. (laughs) It's nothing new. When I get ten shingles off, I climb up there and start nailing them back on. It rains, there's a storm, I I pile them up. And I don't say that to solicit pity or solicit sympathy. What I want you to know is, I'm right there with you. And I know what you're going through. And I'm going through the same kind of things you're going through. Oh, my mom and dad. Powerful people at one time. Now then, my mom goes to the grocery store. And her shopping list is not about what's on sale. It's about how much she can physically carry from the car to the house. I got a 45-pound box of non-perishables, canned goods. I got to take it down there to them. She can't carry that kind of stuff in and out of the house anymore. And dad can't get in and out of the house. I don't tell you that for sympathy or for pity. It is my privilege to care for my loved ones. But I want you to know, and I want everybody to know, I'm right there with you in all the daily life drama that we all face. And when I say I know what you're going through, I want you to know I'm sympathetic. I'm right there too. 
going to the doctor and filling the prescription and when five more tests and all of those things, I do all the same things you do. And I want you to know that I'm there with you. And I want to tell you this morning how I get through the daily life drama. I want to tell you how I get through. I know some people, they use drugs and alcohol, gambling, pornography. That's how they get through. Or they become addicted to their job or addicted to gossip or addicted to this or that. That's how they get through. But I've discovered those ways don't work. I, I, I realized that over 45 years ago. I get through the daily life drama because I know who I am. I know who I am. Do you? I know that who you are is not what you do or your career or your work. I've learned that. That's a hard lesson. I'm not the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. No, no, no. I'm none of these things. I know who I am because I know I am a child of God, created in the image of God, purchased of God through the sacrifice of the Jesus Christ, headed for eternal life with God forever. I know that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and that's how I get through the drama of the day. For over 40 plus years, I put my feet on the ground in the morning, and most every morning I go, what are we going to do today, Jesus? And I'm just so grateful that whatever it is, you're going to include me in it. I get through the daily life drama because I live life to the full. One more slide, please. I live life to the full. And life to the full is a gift that results from you having a connection to Jesus Christ that lets you know at your core who you are. In the lesson today, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, the religious people of His day. And He's telling them who He is. He's telling them why He came. He's telling them what He has for them and His plans for them. And He offers them this great promise of abundant life, life to the fullest, despite the drama of the moment. He uses the imagery of a good shepherd and, and the sheep gate and the sheep fold and the good shepherd that lays down his life for his sheep. The Pharisees, the religious people he's talking to, they're, they're just completely confused. Really, they don't want to hear about that. They're satisfied with how they are and they think they're perfect all by themselves. They don't want to hear about it. It's kind of like when you explain to your 12-year-old child that they're old enough to do their laundry now. And they are. Thank you, Sam. I thought that was going to be funny. <laughs> you take that 12-year-old into the laundry room and you say, this is the washer, this is the dryer, this is the soap. Um, you put the whites here, you put the colors there, and come on, if you can run an iPad, you can run the touch controls on the modern day washer dryer but that 12 year old's going to go mm, uh, mm, uh, I don't want to do that you mean I've got to pick up my own laundry you mean I've got to carry it up down hard all by myself you, you, you mean there's going to be a change something's going to happen differently I just can't accept that and Jesus is promising them and us his promise is Abundant life. A gift of your good shepherd. Despite whatever drama you're going through. I love it. Verse 10. Jesus is speaking here to you. I have come that they may have life. And have it more abundantly. Eternal life. Yes, promised for the future. But right now, here and now. Abundant life. Let that sink in for just a moment. Not more drama. Abundant life. Is it sinking in? You see, we're not promised a life 
without pain or a life without conflict or a life without hurt. We're not promised a way to walk with Christ that's without drama for His walk was the most dramatic of all. We're not promised that we're going to get everything that we want, that we're always going to have perfect health and perfect uh, relationships and perfect finances. You see, a full life is not a cluttered life. A cluttered life is just a mess. And Jesus promises something more than clutter and circumstances. He promises you a quality of life. How can I say it? It was on or about December the 6th, 1996, the best I can remember. It was O'Hara Airport, and I was at a, a church conference. And December the 6th, if you know me, any, that's my son's birthday. I had to go to this church conference. But I had an early flight out, and I'm going to get home. I'm going to be there to be with the son, to be with my bride, to be there at the birthday party. I'm going to get there. The conference is over. Did I mention it's December? Did I mention the airport was in, oh, was in Chicago? Do you think the plane was on time? We're waiting. Would you like to go to Baltimore? Or New York? No. You get me to Atlanta, I'll walk from there. And you know, finally, finally, after a couple of hours, Dr. Van Meter come to the whatever desk it is, like, you know, the principal calling you in for a talk. And um, I've got a seat arrangement for you, but you, we're going to change the seat arrangement, and I'm going, it's going to be a B, isn't it? It's going to be a B. Here it comes. Six foot one. 240 pounds, you're going to stick me in that middle seat, aren't you? And all of a sudden, the ticket popped up, and I saw the ticket even before the... I had my clergy collar on, too. That's how I travel. I get special. <laughs> I had that on. And um, uh, she said, uh, and, uh, there's a ticket popped up. It's 1A. Do you know what seat 1A is? Woo! It's 1A. I go, it's 1A. And she said, you've been upgraded to first class, Dr. Van Meter. And I go, Wee, it's on so we get on the airplane man i was on the airplane 25 minutes before the people back in the seats that i used to have uh, even got on i'm up there at 1a i can stretch out they give me a blanket and a plastic bag is it cashmere oh it's so soft it wasn't but i was telling myself that i got a pillow not the pillow that's just been up here for months uh, a sealed in a bag and handed it to me and then it was snack time wasn't any peanuts. Uh, Dr. Van Meter, would you like the uh, shrimp cocktail or the roast beef entree? <laughs> yeah, break both. Break both. Break both, you know. And I'm sitting up there, and, and it, did I mention it was Chicago in December? Have you ever been there? You can see Lake Michigan and the frozen atmosphere that's coming right at you from it. And so, uh, uh, cold in that blanket. Had this nice snack, got my head on the pillow. That's a good life, isn't it? You know what one thing, though, I was thinking about? I wanted to get home. I knew all this was just a temporary distraction of some temporary luxury, but the only thing that really mattered to me, I didn't care if I was in 1A or 38B. I didn't care. The only thing that mattered to me really genuinely and truly was getting back home, being connected to the sun and my bride and being a part of the celebration. Real life. Not temporary luxuries distractions that's all i could think about i knew that it wasn't long before that blanket was going to be put in a trash bag and that pillow was going to be put in a trash bag and that shrimp cocktail plate was going to be put in a trash bag and that plane would land in atlanta georgia and it would be out in the atlanta uh, what is that county incinerator and all burned up but what mattered was that connection that made life worth living. John 15, 4, 6, hear God's word. Remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear 
fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into, into the fire. We're talking about abundant life that comes from a connection with Jesus Christ. And Jesus also adds in there what happens to those who cut themselves off from Christ. I guess it was 30 years ago, the, Ru the Rwandan tragedy. Do you remember that? It was genocide. One group of people just turned on another tribe and millions were killed across Rwanda. And um, I've always been an advocate and worked very closely with the Presbyterian Outreach Foundation. It is a mission board that precedes even the birth of the PCUSA and all of their missions are evangelical. And I haven't talked to you enough about that, and I need to be speaking to you more about that kind of outreach and mission work. So I apologize for that. It was about maybe 30 years ago, and I was with Bill, and he was uh, the director, and he'd just gotten back from Rwanda. And I always ask, when he, do I want to get right there? Right, when he gets back, while well, it's still fresh on his mind. And I said, Bill, what, what was the big thing? What, what, what was the big thing that you had? And I can't remember the lady's name. Uh, I, I, I can't remember. I, I, Bretta, I'll just call her Bretta, and uh, Bretta, that was not her name. Uh, she was in charge of a school and an orphanage and a mission out here in R Rwanda, and it, it was thatched roofs and cob walls and the, the dirt floors in the buildings uh, as polished and smooth and, uh, as a gym floor in America. And, and Bill had been over there, gone in with a cargo plane, a helicopter, bringing uh, the medicines, the books, the pencils, the Bibles out to the school, out to the orphanage. He's getting ready to leave now after a week there and his team is packing up and he says, um, Abretta, he says, I, I can have one more flight in here, the helicopter coming to get us. We don't need to bring the helicopter in empty what do you need tell me what you need and I will get that helicopter filled with it we'll get it right in here the first thing tomorrow morning and Britte said I have everything I need no 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 now now tell me the truth what is it you need we'll get it right in here in the morning and Bill said that she responded saying you Americans. You Americans believe that life needs to be filled with comforts and conveniences. She said, Jesus Christ provides everything that I need. Mm. And Bill said, he almost, he, I feel his tears right now. He almost cried when he told me this story. And he said, in that moment, through my Western eyes, I saw her as lacking everything. But through her Holy Spirit-filled life, she saw we Westerners were the ones who were truly in, in need. I'm talking to you today about a real living connection with Jesus Christ in your life that brings abundant living despite your circumstances. If you're looking at the outline, I'll tell you today that that kind of a connection with Jesus Christ simply begins when you start believing and receiving. Believing means you believe what Jesus has said. You believe the Scriptures. The ordination vows of Presbyterian deacons, elders, and ministers of the Word. One of the lines is, and all you all elders and deacons have said this at one time or another, that the Scriptures are the unique and authoritative witness to what Jesus is saying to us in the world today. That moment when you just finally as a believer cross up from all the other but ands and this and that's and you just say, okay, I believe what Jesus said. I hope you have that moment. And you have to be in the Scriptures to know what Jesus said to you. You can't just go by what somebody told you Jesus said. And you come to that moment where you just decide that I'm going to believe what Jesus said and I'm going to receive the life that He has for me. And that's the beginning of that relationship 
that commitment that is a, well, that is a abundant life. John 1.12 says, Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in Him, His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Believe and receive. <laughs> Corporations and consumerism, they have all these gimmicks to up their sales. They, pl they, they pr pray on the fact that all of us need to feel like we belong to something bigger than ourselves. Have you noticed this? Make a lot of money doing that. Um, Becky and I, I have a car. She has a truck. Uh, Becky and I, we have a certain car and truck that from a certain manufacturer. You might like that manufacturer. You might not. I've had some of you say, well, I've heard those cars are no good. And that, that's okay. <laughs> I can tell you this. I have never bought a brand new car and paid sticker price. I have never bought a brand new car and had to pay more than 65% of sticker price. That means you don't always get exactly what you want, but you get what they'll sell you. And so we've got, we've got two Chrysler products now. Very happy with them. I remember when we got the first Chrysler, I got a letter. It was like a big certificate from, a, from Fiat of America. Big certificate. Open it up. It's got a free hat in it. It's got a letter. Got a gold embossed. Congratulations. You qualify to be invited to be part of the gold member Ram Elite League. Yeah. And a free hat. And becoming an active member, activating your gold member Ram Elite League uh, club membership, uh, all you have to do is, um, well, you've got to purchase your coat. You use the credit card here to purchase your coat, and your coat, it, it, you can have it in red or gold or black. It looks like something a NASCAR race driver wears. It's got Ram and it's got Elite League and, and a lot of riding on the back. <laughs> kind of a clown suit. Got, if you like that kind of thing, you know, don't, don't jump me in the parking lot. But, but I, I, I saw that, you know, okay, they're trying to maximize their profit by, by getting... By, by helping us to belong to something larger than ourselves. Yet Jesus Christ, your commitment to Him, the promise of abundant life, it all begins when you recognize that He is what you need in that initial journey of believing and receiving in Him. Second thing, your life-giving connection to Jesus Christ expands then when you move from believing and receiving to trusting and obeying. It expands that relationship. My first uh, uh, office as an officer of the church, um, I, about 1980, I guess it was, or 79, uh, I was asked at Becky's church. We were newlyweds. Yes, she got me into church. And um, uh, uh, they invited me to become the chair of the evangelism committee. I was so honored. Right off, they're going to invite me right in and I'm going to be an officer of the church. And isn't, isn't, isn't that something? Of course, that was before I went to seminary and realized nobody wants to be the chair of the evangelism committee. <laughs> Do you know the name of the last chair of the evangelism committee here at Avalay? Anybody know? Lewis Davis. Nobody wants, I don't want to be on that. Put me on something that has money or power. But no, I don't want to be on the evangelism committee or at least something that has food. And I didn't know. I hadn't been to seminary yet. And so I, I didn't, that was before I was taught by the church that an evangelism committee comes on Monday night at 7 o'clock for 90 minutes and talks about outreach. That was before I learned that. So about 20 people in this church, they said, well, when are we going to have our meeting? And I said, well, I don't know. What about 4 o'clock Saturday afternoon? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We got this and this and this and this and this and this. And so half of them quit right off. The other half was just kind of seeing what this new guy was going to do. Give him some rope. He'll hang himself. And we got out there to church parking lot at 4.30 on a Saturday afternoon. What are we going to do? Where are we going to meet? I said, I got these flyers. 
and you go to that neighborhood, and you go to that neighborhood, and we'll all go door to door and invite people to church. <laughs> About eight of them stayed. We did that for several months. It started to get cold, and we got started. We covered the, the nearby subdivisions, and so we started going to the hospital and see those who were sick on Saturday afternoon. And we were up there one Saturday afternoon, Blunt Memorial Hospital, Maryville, Tennessee. I was born in this hospital. And um, we go see this active member of the church. She's ill. And there's about six or eight of us in our room. And everybody's talking at the same time. Nobody's listening. Everybody's uncomfortable. And I, I just had one of those moments, inspirational moment, inspirational moment. I just recognized I, it was a God moment. I recognize that we were not doing anything helpful. We'd probably been better off. She would have been better off if we'd just stayed away. I took my group out, thanked them, sent them home. I drove a big, I was in business. I was a businessman. I drove a big Cadillac, Sedan DeVille. And uh, so you know that I'm not lying to you. I literally got down in the front seat floorboard of this enormous car and I prayed to God that afternoon. I prayed, Lord Jesus, if there is anything that you can show me to do, to do this thing called ministry you've, been, you, you, you've trusted me with, you show it to me right now, right now today, and I will do it. Have you ever got to business with God in a prayer like that? Those are the prayers that gets answered. I pulled out of that hospital. I drove about 150 yards, the entrance to Maryville College, familiar place, my hometown. I've walked through that entrance as a child, home from elementary school, at least 800 times. My parents were adjunct professors there. My mother had her dancing academy on those grounds. Very familiar location. I pull out of that hospital immediately after this prayer, and there is, for the very first time in my life, at the front gate of that college, a 45-foot-tall, three-dimensional pole and linen white cross and the fabric was flapping in the breeze and it said across the front of it reunion i later found out it was there because it was celebrating the birth of the pcusa the reunion of the northern and the southern denominations but for me in that moment that was god and god was answering my prayer and it was you ask i'll tell you you get your education and you go to seminary and you'll be ready for ministry. And I did. I went to the registrar the next day and I told them what my plan was. And most people thought I was nuts. Within six weeks, a chance meeting of another individual. Hey, guy, I was going to invite him to church. You're new in town. Hey, guy, you know, and what do you, what, what do, you do? He said, I've got a small business loan. I want to open up a bakery. I said, I know a real estate agent that'll sell you one. <laughs> the family business was sold. All the money went to take care of my grandmother. I was free of all family responsibilities. Becky and I were absolutely penniless. We had nothing. And I said, Becky, are we going with your music career or are we going with this ministry career? And Becky said, trust and obey. I'm following you all the way. And she's been with me ever since. And um, within three, I, I would walk the halls of Anderson Hall, Maryville College, Building was built between 1812 and 1820 for the education of Presbyterian clergy generations ago with the American Westward Movement. I walked through those halls, old halls. I was given an office in that hall, and I realized that there was business and chemistry and there was um, uh, uh, other sciences, and people were preparing for much more, well, um, financially rewarding uh, opportunities in their life but I knew I always knew and I still know this today there is nothing more important than you can do than to bring Jesus Christ into our lost and dying world I hope somebody at least whispers amen nothing more important than trusting and obeying and I didn't know where and we were penniless and there was no job there was no work but then within weeks the scholarship started coming in 
The church fund started coming in unexpectedly. Within three years, I had a full academic scholarship to um, a seminary, and within two years following that, a full Ph.D. scholarship. John 10, 3, 4 says, Jesus calls his own by name. He leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Third thing, your connection to Christ in abundant life. Um, beyond believing and receiving is loving and serving. And that's so essential. It's the experience of loving and serving <laughs> that separates us from the thief and the robber. It's the experience of loving and serving one another that inspires us to grow in our connection with Christ. Last story of the day. Betsy and Melissa. There's Becky back there. Betsy and Melissa McElroy. They were first cousins. They were in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. They served as volunteers in children's church at the church we were a part of. Stop by the office. I'll show you the picture of Becky's children's choir she had in those days we were there betsy and melissa mcelroy they served as children with us for over seven years every sunday 52 weeks a year nobody had to program them call them remind them or provide them with anything they were there they were ready to go every week if one was gone to this event the other one would come and bring her friend Finally, Becky and I, we announced, well, God is moving us on. I get little notes. Some of them are glad. Some of them are sad. Some of them, <laughs> pretty hateful. But, you know, I opened up Betsy and Melissa McElroy's notes, and she wrote, Thank you, Pastor Mitch, for allowing us to serve our loving congregation by doing children's church all these years. I feel we have gotten a front row seat to what God is doing in the lives of our children. It's so inspiring to us. Fulfilling. Nothing could ever replace our days with you, Becky, and our children's church. The connection to Jesus Christ is experienced through loving and serving. Many of you here today, well, I don't know, I won't say that. Some of you here today, you've been watching your watch. Everything I've said you won't remember three minutes from now. And that's okay. That's okay. We're all at different places. We all need different things. Some of you have been listening to what I'm saying and you're thinking you're ready for a change. And it all starts when you just start believing and receiving. God said it. Good enough for me. Others of you, well, you need to expand that a little bit. And start trusting and obeying. And for some, for, and then for most of us, of course, we've been in abundant life for decades and decades. And so I just encourage you to stay involved. To keep on loving and serving. Because here's God's glorious promise. We love because Jesus first loved us. Hear and heed God's word to you this day. John 10. The Lord Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Father God, you make us to have life to the fullest. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the gate so that all we must do is enter through him and be a part of your kingdom. You have promised us a full life if we abide in Jesus by believing in Jesus, receiving him in our hearts, trusting him, obeying his commands, and serving in his loving name. Help us to always have a desire to love and to serve you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. A text uh, number is coming up on your screen. If you need to make an appointment with me, if you want to know about membership or baptism or an encouragement for the afternoon, a prayer request, 
You let me know that this afternoon in a text message. I'll get back to you before the day is over. When the expectations of your life are starting to fall short, and when your love of stuff and things and comfort really leaves you feeling empty, good news. You're ready for God's glorious promises. Amen.